You can stay awake. Um, that's going to be interesting after all that good food. Thank you so much for everyone who sacrificed money and time and effort and groceries to feed us. That was so good. I mean, that, I don't know where that pizza came from, but I don't think we have pizza that good down in Wetumpka, Alabama. With all due respect to my friends in Wetumpka, I'm not sure that we, uh, we have that. This is a nice handy stand. I'm going to move it over here, and I think I'm just going to hold this. As we talk about this afternoon, the miracles of Jesus. We, we talked some this morning about the prophecies of Jesus, about how those prophecies testify that he would be born into this physical realm and he was a real historical person. And that he was born in Bethlehem of Ephrathah or Judea, not in Bethlehem of Galilee. And uh, that he was the unique Son of God, the unique heaven sent, uh, virgin born, and as we're discussing this hour, miracle working Messiah. But you know, a lot of people, you know, look, let me stop and say this that if God ever did, if there is a God, and if that God ever did come to earth and put on flesh for the purpose, at least in part, of proving who he was. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save the lost. And that he came to seek and to save the lost because he was the pure, the innocent, the non-sinful, only one who ever lived in human form to reach an age of mental maturity and accountability who never sinned. That if that God did come to earth, he would do something in order to prove that he was who he claimed to be. I mean... You know, I don't mean to be irreverent here, but if if someone came up to you and you said, well, hello, you know, how are you? And you told them your name and you asked them their name and they said, no, I'm God. Well, you know, likely you would just think that this person is either just being, yeah, they're, they're either mentally, um, you know, having some problems or they are being very disrespectful, irreverent, and lying, or joking. But 2,000 years ago, someone did come. And he will claim, as we will talk about tomorrow, that he was God in the flesh. And if that is the case, you would demand proof, just like they demanded proof and should have demanded proof 2,000 years ago, and they did. And one of the absolute logical proofs would be that that person, that God in human flesh, would work supernatural miracles. But a lot of people have rejected the miracles of the Bible because they don't believe in miracles, period. And so they don't believe in miracles, and they say, hey, I thus don't believe that Jesus was a miracle-working Messiah. And they don't believe in miracles because they don't believe in God. You know, think about it. If someone says, I don't believe in supernatural miracles because I don't believe in a supernatural God, well, they may not be right in their belief, in their disbelief in a supernatural God, but if there is no supernatural God, then it does make sense to believe there are no supernatural miracles. I mean, right? If that is the case. But if there is a supernatural God and that God ever did choose to prove that he existed or that he was God in the flesh when he came to earth, it would make sense that he would work supernatural miracles. However, many like Carl Sagan would say he was a famous atheistic evolutionist of last century. The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. That's interesting and sad. Think of, you know, it's always interesting when people say that they are human beings who do not know everything, and any being, any, any um, human being who says he or she knows everything would not be a human being. We all know that human beings only know some things. And if we're honest, we would say we know very few things. I mean, I, I really, I know some things. 
but I don't know anything about engineering. Uh, who is a nurse in here? I, is somebody, did I meet a nurse earlier? Yeah. Melinda. Melinda. Okay, I, I don't know anything like, like Melinda or my son who's a nurse. I don't know much about money other than I try not to, you know, spend it crazily and I pay off my credit card every month by the grace of God. Thank you. Uh, but I have a son who knows a lot about money and any, you know, thing I, I'm putting aside for, you know, when I'm perhaps older and not able to work, well, my other son, he's investing that for me. You know, I believe in being a good steward, being a good giver. God wants us to be good givers, but there, you know, there's things I don't know about money, many things. I, I, I was a history major in undergraduate studies and there's still a whole lot of history I don't know. Only God knows everything. So it's interesting to me that if someone says, you know, the cosmos is all there is, was, or ever will be, but he admits he doesn't know everything, how does he know that that one thing he doesn't know is something maybe inside or outside of the cosmos? Well, so many people, they don't believe that there are miracles that prove that God exists or that Jesus is the Son of God because they don't believe in God and others would just say, hey, not only do I not believe in God, but I don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, thus I reject the miracles of the Bible. And those would be two reasons why people do. Well, based on evidence, that is not the purpose or the topics that I'm covering this weekend. But if you were to look at a number of books or uh, hundreds of articles on the Apologetics Press website, you will find that there's plenty of evidence, a lot of evidence that God exists and that the Bible is the Word of God. By the way, you know, it, it may be not as convincing in a 30-second little clip, but I would just say, realistically speaking, I think I can sum up the reason I believe in the Bible in one sentence. To err is human. But the Bible writers got it all right, whether they were talking about the past, the present, or even the future when they wrote about the future. And that is humanly impossible. And why? the all-encompassing reason why I would contend that the Bible is the Word of God. So, you know, I shouldn't be surprised, and you shouldn't be surprised, that not only it's hard to stay awake after a good lunch like we just had, but that many people choose to disbelieve, as sad as that is. But we shouldn't be surprised because of even in Jesus' day, people chose to disbelieve. I mean, even when God put on flesh, did he convince everyone that he was the Son of God? Jesus laid his hands, the Bible says, on a few sick people and healed them. And he, Jesus, marveled because of their unbelief. His enemies said to Jesus after he cast out a demon, he said, by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. So they, they actually admitted that he worked a miracle, but they attributed the miracle of Satan, or to Beelzebub, to the ruler of demons. So, you know, sometimes we wonder, well, Eric, you know, what could, what could I say to convince my friend, my neighbor, my coworker, my son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, what could I say to convince them? And the answer is, I think part of the answer is, even when God was on earth in human form. He didn't convince everyone. That's not, that doesn't mean he's not all powerful. He is. But God has chosen to not overrule human free will. That's what makes us human and not robots. He created us. He lovingly created us by giving us a choice. We see the evidence and we can choose to say, nah, or you know what? I do believe what the evidence indicates. The Bible tells us that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, that the people's response was they couldn't deny that they'd be sitting there. He'd been dead for four days. You know what their response was? We need to kill Lazarus. Poor Lazarus. He just died. Jesus raised him from the dead. And they're like, we got to kill him. Causing people to believe in Jesus. And let's get Jesus too, by the way. If that's what the response was 2,000 years ago, friends, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm saying when, when there is good soil, 
in the good soil hears the good news that's based on good evidence, well, they'll come to believe it. It's not your job or my job to, quote, unquote, make anyone believe, because we can't, and we shouldn't. But we should scatter the seed, right? We should scatter the seed. We should teach the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, Romans 1.16. But what about the miracles that Jesus worked? Well, let, let me mention that there is a serious relationship between God's revelation to man. I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. I'm talking about God revealing, revealing his message to humanity. There is a serious relationship between revelation and confirmation. And many people miss this when it comes to a discussion of miracles. Listen, God worked various miracles throughout the centuries. But it's not that the Bible is just absolutely full. I mean, the purpose of the Bible is not to tell us about every miracle that God ever worked. Any more than as we studied last hour, the purpose of the Bible is not to tell us about every single prophecy that every single prophet of God throughout human history spoke. The Bible is about how to become a Christian and how to live the Christian life. He has given us all things, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, that pertain to life and godliness. But that's not to say that he's recorded everything for us that we might like. There are a lot of questions that people have. Why, why didn't God do this? Or why did God say this? Or why did, and, and you know, if God doesn't reveal that to us, we have to say, well, we, we don't know for sure. He hasn't chose, he, he chose not to reveal that to us. Or maybe we work principally off certain things. But when it comes to miracles, people oftentimes think that God just worked all sorts of miracles all the time for all sorts of, you know, reasons from entertainment to just helping people get better. But really the purpose behind miracles, you see, I mean, think about, think about the Apostle Paul. And he had a thorn in the flesh. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that he did not heal and that Jesus did not heal. In fact, the Bible tells us that he pleaded with the Lord three times that this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, that's you know, a figurative statement, you know, to refer to some ailment, something, some problem that he had. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God's purpose in working miracles was not just, well, let's go heal everyone who has any kind of problems. That doesn't mean that God's not merciful. But you know, if God can do good through me and me be weaker than stronger, well, then is it not to the glory of God for me to be weaker than stronger? I tell you what, at 48, I'm much weaker than I was when I was 28 or 18 or 8, all right, in many ways. The purpose of miracles had to do with confirming the word. Moses, when he went before Pharaoh, they're like, well, God, how, why is he going to believe me? Well, throw your rod down. What's that rod going to turn into? Oh, a serpent. Pick it up. What's it going to turn back into? A rod. Put your hand in your chest. Your hand's going to turn white as snow. Be leprous. Put it back in your chest. Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be healed. These were signs not to entertain Pharaoh, but to prove to Pharaoh that these were the spokesmen of I am that I am. Tell Pharaoh what? Tell Pharaoh I am who I am. That I am the great I am. That's the purpose of miracles was to confirm what they were teaching. The apostles were given the ability when they were sent out on the Great Commission to work various miracles for the purpose of proving that they were actually from God. All right? Now we have God's word confirmed in written form. God is not working as I can see and judge based upon my study of scripture and the view of reality. He is not working like Jesus was working those miracles 2,000 years ago the way, uh, today, the way he was doing it then. I mean, prophets of God, spokesmen of God today, preachers, teachers, 
elders. Men and women are not going out and raising the dead like Lazarus. Not supernaturally reattaching severed ears of Malchus. I'm not saying God's not working today. God is. I mean, I pray to God. I pray to God that God helps in a number of different ways and believe that God is working today. I believe what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says, that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. I believe that every time that a child is conceived, that God is creating a soul. I'm not saying God's not doing things today. I'm saying the kind of supernatural miracles that he was working 2,000 years ago, a little different than the so-called, very different than the so-called miracle workers of today, where a lot of nebulous aches and pains are supposedly healed. What everyone admits is, if there is a God, and if he ever decided to put on flesh and reveal himself as God, it is logical that he would have performed supernatural feats for the purpose of convincing his human creation that he is who he is claiming to be. Jesus said this. Think about it. In John 10, verse 37 and 38, Jesus said, if I do not do the works of my Father, do not, notice this phrase here, do not believe me. Can you believe that Jesus ever said, do not believe me? And he said, if I do not do the works of my Father. Jesus is saying, I'm offering evidence that I am from my Father in heaven. That's a serious claim. That I'm from my Father, and I'm working the works to prove that I'm from my Father, and if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But... If I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The purpose of the Gospel of John, John would write, well, Jesus could be on the other sides in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believe you may have life in his name. You remember in Matthew chapter 11 that John the baptizer, John the immerser, sent his disciples when he was in prison by Herod Antipas. Well, isn't that something? Don't, can't you just appreciate and admire the courageous you know, bravery of John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, who would stand up to Herod and tell him, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's life. We need teachers and preachers who will kindly, lovingly, probably with maybe even tears in our eyes say hard truths that the world needs to hear that God created one man for one woman for life and the only exception that I see in scripture is in Matthew chapter 19 which was such a hard thing for Jesus' disciples to hear that when they heard it they were like well I guess it's better for people not even to get married if that's the kind of commitment As I read scripture, the Bible tells me there's only two reasons I know of that I should never be married to Janet. Number one is if she passes away. And number two is if she committed adultery and I chose to put her away for that, which I don't have to. And many marriages have been saved even through bad mistakes and sinful mistakes that have been made. John the baptizer told Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. She needs to go back to your brother. That's, that's his wife, not yours. And he went to prison. And ultimately, Herodias, after her daughter danced before John, the, uh, uh, danced before Herod, and Herod said, you can have anything you want, up to half my kingdom. He said, or she said, being prodded by her mother, I want the head of John the baptizer. Delivered to him on a platter. Before that, John the baptizer sent his disciples to Jesus. Maybe he had a moment of, of doubt, like all of us, maybe sometimes. And he said, here's John the baptizer. He's the forerunner, the preparer, another messianic prophecy, of the Lord. Jesus is coming and he's going to be prepared. The forerunner is going to be John the baptizer, the son of uh, Zacharias. And I just lost his wife's name, Zacharias, and someone help me out here. Elizabeth, thank you so much. 
I mean, it would seem he may have had a momentary time lapse of, you know, just kind of, I mean, he's in prison. Like, maybe he's wondering, Jesus, get me out of prison. I don't know what he was thinking. But I know he was human. And as humans, sometimes we, we not only sin, sometimes we can just have doubts that maybe we don't need to have. Or if we do, we need to work through them. He said, are you the Christ? Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? I want you to see how Jesus responded to these disciples of John the Baptist who came to Jesus. He quoted from Isaiah, who seven centuries, 700 years earlier, said this. Behold, your God will come. Your God will come. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. He's letting, I'm not saying there's not also some figurative element to this, but in, in a very literal sense, when God came and put on flesh, he was fulfilling also the prophecy of Isaiah saying this is what he will do. He will heal people of their ailments and of their diseases. Now in the last few minutes that we have together in this hour, let's look at some real reasons why the miracles of Jesus are credible testimonies of his divine nature and teachings. All right, so if you... Uh, are able to stay awake here for a few more minutes before you get another cup of coffee today. I'm just assuming there's a plethora of coffee and creamer and sugar. And uh, before that break, let's just look at a few reasons here. Maybe you'll want to take a few notes. First of all, I would say, hey, there, these are, are serious reasons why Jesus' miracles are credible testimonies. Look at some of these reasons. Number one, countless Thousands witness them. This is not one of those situations where, oh, someone in the most remote part of the earth that only one person ever saw supposedly did something supernatural. No, this is this is something where God's word, you know, of all the things that God could have told us, one of the things he did repeatedly through the gospel accounts was say Jesus did this and this and this and this and all of these people were witnesses. I mean, think about it. Jesus was in Cana of Galilee at a wedding feast and the Bible tells us in John chapter 2 that he changed water to a very tasty beverage and he, he did this and made 120 or 30 gallons a piece of six water pots. That's according to my New King James translation. That's John chapter 2, verse 6. Well, that's, what? 120 to however many, my math right, 6 times 30, 180 gallons. Listen, you come to my house, you come to my house for a party, we're going to have a couple of gallons of Milo sweet tea. I don't know if you have Milo sweet tea up here. Y'all don't drink cold sweet tea up here. Do you? We do down in the southern U.S. of A. Okay. Well, we're going to have some lemonade, a couple of gallons maybe, maybe some Coca-Cola. Listen, y'all, that lunch was stupendous. When I can have pepperoni pizza or uh, Canadian bacon with bell peppers and then have another kind of pizza with Canadian bacon and pineapple and Coca-Cola classic? Mm. Ooh, tell you what. You know, we, you see about how many we have here today and how we've had some nice drinks and coffee. We have 120 to 180 gallons of that in there? Uh, no. I, my point is, there, there's no telling how many people were at this wedding feast. And Jesus worked an amazing miracle. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus was in a house where people all over that area were there, the Bible tells us, and that it was so full when there was a man who was paralyzed, who wanted in this house, that they let him down through. There were people, the Bible tells us, from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. 
They come from out of every town, Luke 5 and verse 17. And they uncover part of the roof. Imagine that. Imagine being in your house like we were at Gary and Ellen's last night. And it was so crowded that they just started breaking apart your roof and letting down a man. That's a crowded house, y'all. Why didn't you just come through the front door? Well, because it's too crowded. And he healed them. There's a lot of people there who saw this. Or how about in the number of times he worked miracles in the Jewish synagogues? Or before a great multitude, John 5, verse 3. Or before 5,000 men besides women and children, where he turned five loaves and two fish into a plethora of food, feeding thousands of people. Or on another occasion, when there were 4,000 men besides women and children, in Matthew chapter 15, Jesus worked wonders and signs and miracles before thousands of people, countless thousands witnessed his miracles. Even his enemies acknowledge them. I mean, think about it. Following Lazarus' resurrection, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do for this man works many signs? These were his enemies, and they admitted that he worked many signs. Herod had desired for a long time to see Jesus, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. Well, why would he hope that if he didn't think he could do that? Of course, we've already noted how Matthew 12, the enemies of Jesus said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by meals of the ruler of demons. What did they admit? Well, then he cast out demons. Jesus was scolded by a ruler of a synagogue for healing on the Sabbath day in Luke 13. In John 9, when healing a man who had been born blind, they asked, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? Well, the implication was he wasn't, wasn't a sinner and that he did do such signs. He healed a man who had been born blind. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus at night, admitted to Jesus, no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And I'm not necessarily saying that Nicodemus was his enemy, but he represented a group of people in which many were his enemies. Or how about the great many of the Jewish priests who previously were unbelievers, but then became obedient to the faith? What was it that convinced them? No doubt the supernatural resurrection of Jesus had a whole lot to do with that. Countless thousands witnessed his miracles. Even his enemies acknowledged them. And thirdly, there were multiple, not just one, but multiple writers who attested to his Miracles. I mean, think, think about it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul. I mean, multiple independent witnesses. The feeding of the 5,000 is found in all four gospel accounts. I mean, these are independent witnesses. You know, if, if there is a crime that happens and you have one person who sees it, that's something. But what if an officer is able to interview this person and this person and this person and this person and this person as independent witnesses who all appear to have no motivation other than just to tell the officer of the law what they saw and they all give their test? Would that be considered as pretty, uh, you know, valuable testimony in a court of law? Yes. You know, unless it's known that they are known liars and they're, you know, someone's paying them to say this. Well, the, the apostles and Bible teachers and, and Bible writers, they weren't being, they, they weren't becoming rich and famous off what they were teaching. In fact, they were just being persecuted for what they were teaching. The accounts, furthermore, are similar enough so as to not be contradictory, but varied enough so that one cannot reasonably conclude that the writers participated in collusion. Or just coming up with a story together that has been fabricated and not as individuals who were independent witnesses of these things. There's no indication of that. Even the first century historian who was a Jew captured by the Romans, jo uh, Josephus, said Jesus was a doer of wonderful works and drew over to him many of the Jews and many of the 
Gentiles. He admitted that there were some wonderful things that Jesus did. Even the Jewish Babylonian town had mentioned that he practiced their word for it as an unbelieving document was sorcery. You think that might be an unbeliever's way of saying, well, he was doing some something, some trickery of some sort. Well, if they were unbelievers, that may very well be their way of explaining. There were some amazing things that Jesus did. Fourthly, Bible writers repeatedly said and testified that they, they're just focused on facts, not on, you know, we talked about well-known authors and books earlier. You look at the most purchased books and read books in, in world history, and especially the last few decades. There are a lot of fantastic fictional things. You want to be rich and famous? Well, I'm not saying go do this. I'm just saying you know, a lot of people who are making up stories, you know, you watch movies, it's made up stories, mostly. The Bible writers, they weren't getting rich and famous by making up stories. This is what they repeatedly testified, that we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his, his majesty. These are things that we've seen. John would write in 1 John 1. These are things which, from the beginning, we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. They were wanting people to know with everything that they have. Listen, we're telling you things that we know to be true because we have seen him. We have touched him. We have handled him. We have heard him. And we're declaring these things to you. And what did John get for it? What did Peter get for it? Death. Dying for Jesus. Jesus prophesied that, by the way. In John chapter 21, he said, Peter, you're going you're gonna to die this way. Your arms are going to be stretched out. John, you remember where he wrote Revelation? Exiled on the what? On the island of Patmos? You know, we act like, oh, you know, he's just exiled. You want to get exiled? I mean, that's what they got for testifying this is what is the case. And they testified individually, multiple individuals, like the Apostle Paul, saying, Jesus was seen by Cephas, the resurrected Jesus, then by the twelve, and over 500 brethren at once, of whom the great part remained in the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. We've seen the resurrected Jesus. Again, I, when you think about the study of miracles, think about the cumulative case here. All these things coming together to make a very, very powerful case that Jesus did what the Bible writers said he did. And the Bible writers had no financial, uh, healthy incentive to say and do and write these things. They were, if they knew that they were perpetrating a hoax, you know, if we just, all of us today said, let's come up with some story and let's tell the world that this was the case. The first time that someone comes up to you and me and says, listen, you, you say that again, we're, we're about to nail you to a cross. Like, oh, wait, I was just kidding. You Listen, we just got, got together and we just came up with this. We, we didn't know that y'all were going to kill us. The, these Bible writers, New Testament apostles and prophets, they were dying for what they were teaching. Read Acts chapter 12. The apostle James was killed with the sword. Read Acts chapter 7. Stephen was stoned to death. And, 
And Saul of Tarsus was there holding on to the clothes of those who were stoning him to death. Why would he become a Christian? He was trying to kill Christians. And then he was the one being sought by others to be killed. That's why he was let down through a wall in a basket in Damascus. Did he really see Jesus on the road to Damascus? He believed it with every bit of his fiber. He, he went from persecuting God's people to being God's people to dying for what he was teaching, what the Bible writers were writing. I like what, um, what this individual, Henry S. Kerr, said nearly 100 years ago in the journal Bibliotheca Sacra. He said, we're not asked to believe in the myths and legends of the kind associated with paganism or in cunningly devised fables or old wives' tales. We are besought to accept sober stories of incidents which cannot be accounted for in any other way save that God was directly and intimately at work in the matter. Fifthly, Jesus' signs were many and varied. It's not like the Bible tells us, well, he did one thing. And he did this one amazing thing. Now the, the, they go out of their way to tell us that he showed power over affliction. And not just over headaches, okay? Not just over back aches, and I'm not minimizing back pain. I know that is real. Not just over foot aches. I mean, the Bible is not going to say he, he not only healed Peter's mother-in-law, uh, he not only could heal people of leprosy, who had ever heard of such? Someone who was paralyzed? Get up, rise, and walk? A man who had been born blind. A woman who had had an issue of blood for years that wouldn't stop. I don't know if you've watched The Chosen much, but that is one moving scene. We can read it in Scripture, but when you see the, in that particular, you know, theatrical representation of that. That's a moving scene. I thought they did that justice, if you will. Maybe as best as you can in some form like that. Jesus showed his power by taking a man whose ear had just been cut off by Peter, bless Peter's heart. I mean, at one moment, he's willing to risk his life with Jesus by cutting off the ear of Malchus, and then he's denying him three times. I'm not sure we're so different. I have my ups and downs. I don't know about you all. I mean, that's a lot of variety and many different things that happened that Jesus worked amazing wonders. He not only showed his power over affliction, he showed his power over nature. In what way? Well, he, he turned water to wine. He, he calmed a storm. He walked on water. Not seeing that at that lake we went to last night, right? Gary and Ellen. People walked out on the pier, or whatever you call that. They, they weren't walking out there on the water. Feeding thousands of people. Making a fig tree. But he showed in a variety of ways his power over nature. His power over the spirit realm, over demons. Mark would say he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And perhaps, maybe most amazingly, he showed his power over death. Remember he raised Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son and Lazarus, not to mention himself, God raised from the dead. Furthermore, his miracles are not what we kind of might expect if we were the ones working miracles. You know, if I had the power to work miracles, I might say, I might work a miracle on my gut right now because I'm feeling some indigestion. Like, well, let me just, and then I might, you know, make y'all laugh because I was able to work a miracle by healing my indigestion, all right? And then, you know, if one of you were about to, you know, if you were mad at me and you were about to hit me with a water bottle, I might just like, oh, I might just take that water bottle and I might turn it around like we would see in the movies and I would just throw it right back at you without ever touching. You know, just kind of silly, silly stuff that we would do because, well, because we're not as mature as, as Jesus, as God. 
You know, we get mad at our brother or sister or our coworker or our fellow students, classmates. Who knows what we would do? Jesus? His miracles weren't. They're not characterized at all. I mean, silly and, and overboard. I mean, um, as Simon Curley wrote years ago, the gospel records are marked by restraint and sublimity in the description of miracles. They're not characterized by the sorcerer's hocus pocus. Jesus didn't, I bet you can't pull the rabbit out of a hat, Jesus. But he, wasn't, he wasn't feeling that. He wasn't about that, pulling rabbits out of hats simply to abuse people. He didn't, he didn't turn his enemies into stones and set their robes on fire. You know how many times Jesus, can you imagine? I mean, Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus made the world. Do you not think that he could have just zapped his enemies one by one with anything he wanted to zap them with. And it's just not what he did. That wasn't his purpose in performing miracles. And he was in control. Remember, he was he was meek. He was humble. He was power under control. There are a few parallels to Jesus and the magicians of the ancient world. And then Finally, this afternoon, the miracles of Jesus are not being duplicated today. I mean, think about how his miracles knew no limitations. He healed a severed ear with the touch of his hand. He restored a shriveled hand in the midst of his enemies. He was different. His miracles were proving what he said about himself and the message that he taught. He healed many of their blindness, including one man who had been born blind. I don't think anyone today, I mean, listen, there, there's a lot of crazy things today with AI, right, with artificial intelligence, a lot of, you know, things that are said on the news that are, I, I don't know about Canadian news, but I know down in the, in, in the, in the U.S., oh, man, you hear all sorts of stuff on the news, on social media, and they will just, I mean, turn things. They mean 180 degrees different than what they were, in, you know, really meant and when they were stated. Uh, wow, when you, you think about you think about Jesus and the miracles that he worked. They're not like the things that people allege that are happening today. He raised the dead simply by calling them out. I've had dear loved ones and friends who have passed from this life that no one raised from the dead. I'm not saying they're not spiritually somewhere else. I'm talking about their physical bodies. It's not happening. And I'll get to that last, the last point here in just a moment. Just to say, Jesus went about healing every sickness and every disease. And these are, I believe, powerful points to be made. Reasons for the credible nature of of the miracles of Jesus. I am not suggesting, don't leave here, don't leave yet, by the way, but don't leave here thinking, well, Eric doesn't believe that God's working. You know, God's working. You know, every time someone makes a good confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and based on that confession, they're willing to repent of their sins, based on who Jesus is and what he wants us to do. Repent of their sins and be immersed in water, Acts 2, 38. Repent and let every one of you be baptized for, Peter said, for the remission of sins. You know what happens every time someone is, does, you know, Jesus died and rose from the dead. And Paul would say that that form of doctrine, Romans chapter 6, about verse 17, that form of doctrine is found in, that, that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is found in, is likened to us 
Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He said, we die to the old man in the watery grave of baptism and rise up to walk a new life. And you know what God does every time that happens? He forgives. He washes away sins. By the blood of Jesus. Is God doing stuff today? Absolutely. Is God answering the prayers of his people? Now, you might say, you know, you might say, well, he's not answering all my prayers. God answers the prayers of the righteous. The Bible tells us the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. That doesn't mean that God gives you and me everything we want. Half or more of the stuff we want, we don't need. Amen? Maybe more than that. Furthermore, God wants us to ask according to his will, not my will. We pray, right? May your will be done. Oh, may, you know, I might say, now, Lord, if it be your will, you know, Jesus prayed, if it be your will, let this cup pass from you. Did that cup, cup pass from Jesus? Or did he go ahead and die on that cross for our sins? That example alone ought to show us that not everything we ask, we get. Furthermore, sometimes the answer is wait. Abraham waited 25 years for Isaac. Sometimes we live in this age of instant gratification. I want what I want right now. Amazon, bring it to my door tomorrow. God says, I'm not sure that that's healthy in terms of sometimes the Lord wants us to be patient, to wait on the Lord, to trust in Him. God works. God is alive and well. So don't leave here thinking, well, Eric said that God doesn't work. You know, the kinds of amazing miracles that Jesus worked. You see, our God, our God is alive and well. And if he's not working the kinds of miracles that Jesus has worked 2,000 years ago, it's not because he can't work those miracles. It's because he chooses for this time not to work them. But one day Jesus is going to come back. He's going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. That's going to be a miraculous, supernatural, amazing event that we need to be ready for. It's going to be a grand day. May God help us recognize Jesus now as the King of kings and Lord of lords, as the great Messiah, before he returns, not having made that good confession, not having repented of sin and been baptized for the remission of sins, and walking in the light as he is in the light. Because when he comes back, he wants us to find us being enamored with, in love with the miracle working Messiah who, by the grace of God, uh, has done many things in my life not the least of which, the most of which, bringing me into the kingdom of God. And many, many other things of which I am absolutely undeserving. Thank you for this, uh, your kind attention. I think we have one more break and uh, one more lesson. And I hand this over to you. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Once again, we'll be taking a short...